Okay, so welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for coming to this um, session. I was kind of amazed that we haven't heard the word digitalization in all the keynotes. And I don't know if you were also quite amazed to hear that. And what is also amazing is that out of all these sessions, there's only one. And we only have a few talks today. And I think it's very nice to see so many people here to discuss this issue. Um, I'm coming from ETH Zurich, and we have our co-chairs, Peter Messley, who you already know, and Julie Zering, and also from the Center of Development and Environment in Bern. And before um, the four, uh, five talks, there's one person missing, I would like to give a very short introduction. And when you see this picture, you might think, what does this have to do with digitalization? And this place of a lifetime, you probably know them. Maybe you even took a selfie in front of that place. It's in Switzerland. And it has changed dramatically the land use around that area. And who has defined how beautiful this is? Social networks. So the question is, who defines how these things are? How is this influencing our land use? And what is the role of the owner of this restaurant now with all these changes? His role was he left. So it seems like there is a disconnect between who is making these decisions and who takes the responsibility at the end. And there are many other issues when you look a little bit at what pops up when we talk about digitalization. And it's not like these are issues we might think we need to address, because they are reality. They are things which happen at the moment. And I think we need to begin to tackle really these issues. We cannot just ask ourselves what are the issues, but to begin to discuss these issues, especially related to the land use change. Okay. <laughs> so I would like just um, to bring up four paradigms. And why paradigms? Because I think there's no solution at the moment. I think we don't have the solution. I think we're all here also to discuss it. But I think these paradigms will allow us to discuss a little bit the pros and cons, the risks, but also the big opportunities. And to try out of that maybe to develop some enablers for this transformation pathway towards these sustainable development goals. So how can we have a, a key, a levy, to change these uh, situation, also understanding these risks? And the first one is we have this huge data growth, but is it also just a data expansion? The second one is what about all these personalized, we talk about even personalized medicine. It sounds a little bit like this, but we get the data we want. On the other side, who is defining what data you get? The real time or the high computing cost? And a thing probably we're going to discuss even more today because there are a few talks about blockchain, about equal rights and top-down control. And just let me illustrate it every time with the two sides. On one hand, you see on the left two exactly same areas. They were uh, assessed with two different data sets. One is a data set, a land use plan data set from the area, and the other one was done with OpenStreetMap. And I've been to many sessions this week who try to categorize stuff, and they all has, have a great solution how to categorize it, but it's going to be extremely dependent on what kind of data set you're going to use. And the question is, who is giving you that data set? OpenStreetMap is going to drive for you. You're not taking the car driving to the areas to take the data. So there is a decision, a pre-decision, on where this data is taken. And you see that the OpenStreet data is much better in terms of category, but it has many white areas. On the right side, you see um, big data, which was used to understand what, is the, what are the driving forces of tourism in Swiss landscapes. And depending on, wi on which machine learning algorithm you put them in, the most important drives are going to be different. 
So again, we are at the moment, I've heard also many talks um, yesterday about machine learning and what beautiful things they do, but often we don't know what kind of algorithm and who has taken the decision on which algorithm to take and we don't have the comparison, so we have to think about that. The second thing is personalization or big nudging. I'm sure when you open, uh, you see I'm a little bit tan because I went, I, I shame on me, but <laughs> I went to Nysteria and when I opened it, they, <laughs> that's what they gave me. Uh, so um, the computer told me to go back to nice areas. Um, so the question is, um, I have given my data, I have opened uh, my pattern, and it's going to give me certain information back. And this can be positive, of course, for me, great, but on the other hand, uh, it's called the eco-effect. And if you do this, you're going to get more and more of your same kind of friends. So I'm going to talk now with all the people who are doing, I'm not doing diving, but maybe all the people who like fish or something like that, by high biodiversity. And these people talk together, and it's going not to bring a concept, but it's going to polarize these different people because they always talk in their same eco realm uh, states where they have their answers. And on the left side, you see here that the same kind of problem can put certain big companies to take the lead on developing land use as these new cities, for example, designed by Google or uh, Amazon, for example, who are really leading certain development without any kind of other participatory process. And just to put this, uh, it was in 2005, maybe you know Dirk Helbing, he's a professor at ETH, he's a very interesting person, a social scientist, and you see how in the, he was 2005, and how he said in 2015, the collective intelligence will replace the top-down. And the <clears throat> third point is about uh, equal right and top-down control. I don't want to go on the left side because I think we're going to have a lot of discussion about uh, this uh, discussion on blockchain and how this can maybe support to have equal rights. On the other hand, I'm sure you all know um, that depending what kind of data, I work a lot in Singapore, for example, and I get very, very blurred data. So the people filtering the data are filtering information out and they give me only a part of the information. So the result is a result which is already filtered by an institution. And the question, I was just talking with one of the speakers also, is the question, how do we as a land use science community involve into defining these semantics? How the data, how the collective data is linked into the internet when you do a search? How are you getting the data? And at the moment, we are not involved at all. We have no community really trying to define the semantics. What are they? What, how are the um, information linked together? And there's languages about that. And uh, I think there uh, is really something important we need to do. And the fourth point, um, real time and time <laughs> Maybe if I put it here. Um, the fourth is about real time and high processing cost. Um, the question is, you see on the right side, all kinds of data can be used also to do, to steer your behavior, maybe for good things. I mean, if you look at your insurance company, if they know all your information, if you go jogging, if you have a Google app on your smartphone, they're going to give you a um, decrease in, uh, in your premium, etc. So these are collective systems which are driving your behavior. On the other hand, we're still very, very far from understanding the data. This is, for example, a point cloud, so a LIDAR data on a city, and it's very, very difficult to identify, is this a tree, is this a house, the computer doesn't understand. So again, here we need to have a lot of work of what does the computer understand, how does it define the information to be really used in a real-time situation. So maybe we have time to come back to these four paradigms. Maybe in your talk you have time to discuss it a little bit or to uh, tackle it. And our first speaker is Desiree. Is that yours? Okay. You need to take this. Now it's your turn. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, so thank you for the introduction. So today I am presenting on the role of blockchain for representing land use rights. Um, I have a short part, um, presentation today, so I'll briefly talk about the problem of the verbal land market, motivated by my case study work on Trinidad and Tobago and small scale agriculture in Trinidad and Tobago. Then a short introduction into blockchain and then how the properties of the blockchain relate to properties of the um, verbal land market and some limitations and future work uh, considerations. So the formalization of land rights is supported by development agencies as a pro poor approach for dealing with inequality and for the economic advancement of the poor. Yet in the global south, um, access to land is mediated or transacted through vernacular or verbal land markets. And these are informal markets through which land is allocated outside statutory regulations. So participants of informal markets um, are granted informal access and use rights that are not recognized or that are not protected by statutory regulations. So the coexistence of um, formal and informal markets, especially in the global south, South results in gaps in land registries, which makes tracking land use development problematic, as well as property taxes, um, insecure tenure for um, informal users of land. And it also prevents land users from accessing lines of credit and excludes them from investment opportunities because they can't um, use land as a collateral. So the motivation to examine the potential of blockchain in dealing with informal access, as I mentioned before, came from my work on um, land tenure and livelihood resilience of small scale farmers in Trinidad and Tobago. And for those of you who may not know, so Trinidad and Tobago is a small island developing state um, that is just seven kilometers off the coast of um, Venezuela. So it has an average size of 5,000 square kilometers, so it's eight times smaller than Switzerland approximately 1.4 million inhabitants and 4.87% of the land space is arable. But overall, the verbal land market in general, so one of the one of the predominant messy land relationships that come out from this verbal land market in Trinidad and Tobago is this um, tenure relationship called family land. So basically, it, it is a parcel of land that is held in common by family members and it's passed on from generation to generation. So for example, 70% 70 70 of rural, rural lands and 40% of urban lands are held under this family tenure regime in Tobago. But the state recognizes individualization of land rights and titling and not the collective family unit. So hence this existence of this informal land market. But this informal access to land is also prevalent in the agriculture sector. So while 20% of the local demand for food is provided by, um, by farmers in Trinidad and Tobago, 80% of this demand is produced on lands by farmers who have informal access on state lands. So this is a simple schematization of the problem with informal access in the agriculture sector in Trinidad and Tobago. So you have a landowner, you have a farmer. The landowner owns the land. The farmer wants access to the land for planting. The landowner will enter a verbal agreement or arrangement for rental. Money is transacted, but there is no documentation of this use right. There's no rental contract agreement, lease, um, nothing like that. But without documented proof of use right, a farmer in Trinidad cannot and access a farmer's identification card, which is a credential, which, um, which um, legitimizes the status of the farmer as a farmer in the eyes of the state. Also too, the agricultural sector in Trinidad and Tobago is heavily subsidized by the government for the purpose of agricultural productivity. But to access incentives and subsidies, you need to have an identification card. Also, the state also has an agricultural development bank which offers subsidized loans to farmers. But again, to access this, you need your farmer's identification card and documented proof of use rights. So to interact with the formal system by the, of the government, 
you need to have proof of documented use rights. So from this um, verbal land market situation going on in Trinidad and Tobago, I identify three key dimensions. So verbal land market is about handshake deals, as I mentioned. So access is granted without documentation. Rent is collected by the landowner and the farmer in some cases may get a receipt of payment or the landowner may document in his notebook um, that the farmer um, paid his rent. But the, one of the, uh, what the other dimension is the legitimation. So the moral basis to make claims. So a farmer could only make claims from the state for access to incentives if he has this um, tenure documentation, which in this case, the, um, the formal system, with the formal system, um, tenure documentation is used as a mechanism of exclusion and also confidentiality and trust. So um, the farmers um, also um, stated that um, the particulars of rental agreement are not documented by landowners because of fear of adverse possession. So then with these three dimensions coming out of the verbal land market, I asked myself how can the blockchain address these issues? So for those who may not know, so blockchain is a peer-to-peer -peer, um, protocol that enables the secure transfer and tracking of commodities over the internet. The aim of it is, is to transfer digital value between parties. Um, the ledger is maintained by a distribution of nodes. All transactions are, um, are checked by the, participation, by the participating nodes in a network. And once a node validates a transaction, it is um, executed. So this is known as the consensus validation. Um, each node maintains and continuously verifies a complete copy of all transactions. Um, transactions written onto the block, it's done in a chronological order. So you have a history of your, the blockchain stores a history of transactions and it's also immutable, meaning that um, anything written on the blockchain cannot be changed. So now, so we have current examples of blockchain technology in practice and land management. So Sweden is the most advanced, so they are in their final testing phase this year, so they would roll out their blockchain for um, land administration. And Honduras um, started in 2015. They had some hiccups due to um, political reasons, and now they're back on track with rolling out their um, blockchain and it was motivated because of the reason of corruption and trying to eliminate title fraud. So now, how do we now leverage these dimensions of the verbal land market with um, the properties of the um, blockchain? So how can the blockchain be used, the potential be used to um, deal with the issue in the verbal land market? So this handshake deal, so it is peer to peer um, so the peer-to-peer -peer nature of the handshake deal, meaning that we need to have these two um, parties involved and this um, transaction, even though it's stored in their memory, is sort of reflective in the um, nature of the um, blockchain. Um, confidentiality and trust. Um, so the system is immutable, so changes cannot be made. So the nature of the landowner's ownership, so he's fear, he fears adverse possession. So this um, fear could be eliminated because um, changes cannot be made to the nature of his ownership and the use right will be um, documented in, uh, in the block. Uh, so therefore it protects him from adverse possession and the most important is the legitimation in order for agricultural livelihoods. So in the informal use right can be recorded through a transaction in the system stored across the nodes and then the participating, the participating agencies or state agencies of the blockchain can then verify that this person is a farmer and then he can access state incentives and these incentives can be um, transacted across the um, blockchain. But the system in Trinidad is predominantly paper-based, so there are some limitations in embracing this um, blockchain technology. First and foremost, there must be political will and the political will needed by the state to implement the blockchain. So that's the first hurdle that needs to be crossed in, in my developing country context. The other situation is that digital technologies needs to be embedded in the consciousness of the state, in the con consciousness of the institution. So the institution policies, regulations may, may have to change to, um, to adopt this new technology and also at the public level. So the landowner and the, the landowner and the farmer has to trust the system to even begin to engage with the system. So the system is not a panacea for the social um, a social situation going on. The social situation needs to be sorted out before we could step into the um, step into the technology. And on the technical side is scalability. So 
I am talking about dealing with um, the land use right documentation and also transacting subsidy payment, also verifying or authenticating that this person is a farmer. And so scalability has been an issue in blockchain, so dealing with large volumes of transactions in a fast and secure manner. So in my case, we're talking about approximately 10,000 farmers in Trinidad and Tobago, and if everybody wants to request subsidy payments and overload the system, so this has to, this issue of scalability has to be um, dealt with. And this brings me to the end of my presentation, so I made it in time. <laughs> Um, I have not um, analyzed the energy cost, but I know it will be based on the consensus mechanism that the, um, the, uh, the, let me see, the designer of the architecture decides to take on. So if it's proof of work consensus mechanism, it's more energy consuming. If it's proof of, um, proof of stake, then it's less energy consuming, but the trade-off is in security. So then the question is, do you want to trade off security for um, energy um, consumption. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think for developing countries, their key motivation for the blockchain is dealing with title fraud. So this is a with title fraud. So this is a big issue in the Caribbean and Latin America. So we, there's a prevalent case of people selling people's land under them because our systems are predominantly paper-based. So the main motivation is to arrest this situation and they see the blockchain as, a, as this um, possible um, solution to this situation. But I agree, I understand the cost, the issue with the energy consumption and I actually um, had that um, thought running through um, which would be the best um, consensus mechanism that is um, energy efficient but does not um, 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 uh, limit security and speed of transaction. And I think that's still an ongoing issue that the blockchain technology, blockchain community still has to address. Yeah, thanks a lot, very interesting. I, you tell us basically about the reactor group, the farmers, the landowners and the government, and that, that seems to be quite a huge power differential. I mean, the farmers may have access to this sort of technology, the landowners may have a lot of vested interests that this thing don't sense because they have benefits from it or what it is, yeah. and the government was afraid to <laughs> hand out the authority to, to the cloud, basically. You know, do you have a strategy how to overcome these power differentials, or how at least you have a plan? <laughs> Uh, um, if I had a strategy, then we solve a lot of social issues. <laughs> are you trying to do a pipe on that? Or are you trying to put it into practice? Um, um, at the moment, um, no. So I haven't thought about how to deal with the, um, the power differentials that will occur, but I am aware of it. And um, it is something that is in the forefront of my mind in furthering developing this um, article is how, because from my experience, farmers, yes, farmers don't really engage with technology. So then how do you um, get them to buy in into something that they would not understand the complexity of this? So how do you make it, um, yeah, catchy or, and yeah, I don't have a proper <laughs> strategy for that as yet. Um, oh, thank you for your question. Um, so my uh, exploration into blockchain is still relatively new. So from my case study, um, it was easy, easier for me to look at the most, the simplest 
example that um, comes out from, from this study, which was the, the interrelation between the farmer who was renting from the landowner. And I said, okay, if I could um, focus on this as a simple example and then sort this out, then I could expand to the, um, to the other complex relations. And I, so going, if going forward in the future, I would, like to, I would like to do this. And I think to do this, I need to further sit down and design what the architecture would look like. So I talk about this very theoretically. So this is, these are the dimensions, these are the potentials. But the further research would be um, actually designing the architecture and seeing, okay, how could then these transactions be accounted for in the network? the authentication of the farmer as a farmer, and including um, also the issue, the other complex um, relations like squatting and the family tenure relationship. But to, I think to deal with the family, family tenure relationship, I think first we have to deal with, before it could enter the blockchain, we first, first have to understand how do we begin to represent this in, in a land registry. And I think that's still a big, um, question for the government of Trinidad and Tobago, how do we recognize rights in this family land tenure system? Thank you very much. So our next speaker would be Owen. No, where is he? Here we go. Owen is from the University of Boston, is that correct? Boston University, sorry. So <laughs> That was nearly good. <laughs> okay. So you would need to put this up. Do you want a time tag or are you, do you need a meet to do meet? The half time would you get? Okay. And then one minute. The half time and one minute. And one minute? Okay. Does that sound okay? Is that, does that sound okay? All right. Um, <clears throat> so, keep this here. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Owen Kortner, a first year PhD student at Boston University, and I'm going to talk to you today about the role that blockchains uh, might play uh, in governing sustainable supply chains. So, supply chains have become an environmental governance problem over the last several decades. Um, they've gotten longer, they've gotten more complex. This is a governance problem because <clears throat> uh, it increases our uncertainty about where products come from, who produced them, uh, where they've been, and it's an environmental problem um, important for land system science because we don't know the environmental impact necessarily uh, of, the, of the production of those products. Um, and blockchain is an emerging technology that is being experimented with and applied uh, to supply chain and environmental problems, particularly for uh, purposes of verifying certification and for provenance. Um, and as we go through this today, I, kinda, I want you to imagine the beef supply chain in Brazil, which is uh, an important agricultural commodity and conservation topic that a lot of people in land system science uh, study and are familiar with. This slide uh, shows uh, trades in beef uh, in excess of 125,000 tons uh, in 2014 just to uh, show that supply chains are indeed quite lengthy and quite uh, complicated. Um, Desiree did a, a great job of explaining what blockchain is, so I'm not going to go uh, too far into that, but it's important to just remember that it is a decentralized, distributed, uh, and immutable ledger that is secured by cryptography. Um, so what I want to imagine today, and the, the idea is that we could actually link a blockchain with a physical supply chain um, so that there's a secure record uh, and a trusted record of what's happened to a product as it moves from origin to, to end user. Um, and so you could imagine on the left-hand side of this slide the, the many small ranchers uh, raising and grazing cattle in Brazil, and then eventually they go maybe to a fattening operation and then to a slaughterhouse, uh, and then all the way to the end consumer. And the point is that for each transfer or transformation of a cow uh, in a supply chain, you would create... Uh, a record of that instance, and then it would be added to this this uh, growing record of that of that product. Um, so, 
uh, probably most of us first heard about blockchain with uh, the advent of Bitcoin back in 2008, but since then, uh, it's definitely moved into applications beyond that. According to Doug Galen and a team at Stanford University, um, there's at least 20 early stage pilots looking at how to apply blockchain in agricultural supply chains for, and, and for other environmental problems, as you can see, including land rights, like Desiree talked about. Um, since most of these are less than, the pilots are less than three years old, there's not very much data about how successful they've been, um, but that also means it's the perfect time for the land system science community to think about how to evaluate them. Um, the fundamental promise of blockchain is that it that made it attractive beyond just creating alternative currencies is that it is supposed to guarantee trust. Um, and so to demonstrate what might be possible with this in the context of like the beef value chain, uh, I've pulled some, some ideas from some of the existing pilots, including provenance in the United Kingdom and, and region network in the US. Um, so a lot of these pilots are claiming that they can solve environmental problems and um, Providence, the company, <laughs> is uh, building itself as, as kind of a, a provider of trust to help create trust between companies and the consumers that they're selling products to. Um, excuse me. And this trust is based on the transparency that is supposed to be provided by using a blockchain to monitor that, that supply chain. And so how do you create that transparency? Um, from another uh, early stage pilot, the region network in the US, they imagine a suite of on-farm sensors that you might have, uh, say a beef ranch where data is being collected on soil quality, water quality, and you already have organizations in the case of Brazil like Prodes that are monitoring land cover change um, using satellites. And they imagine that all of this information would be aggregated and then securely uploaded to the blockchain um, to verify that, that relevant environmental info. Um, and then, whoop, uh, just to remind you, so, so we're moving from the farm and then uh, there would be additional like sensors or some sort of tracking mechanism like RFID tags or barcodes throughout the blockchain that would carry that info to the end user. Um, and you know, somebody in a grocery store might scan a QR code with their phone and as though this screenshot shows uh, organic bacon, you could imagine this is deforestation free beef and here's the whole uh, history history of that product. Um, and so today I'm not gonna, uh, there, some of these pilots by bigger organizations have actually been completed and you know, blockchain does work in terms of providing traceability and efficiency. Um, IBM was able to reduce their transaction dispute mediation time by 75% using a blockchain based system. And last year Walmart completed two pilots for their pork and mango uh, supply chains they were able to take their mango tracing time from almost seven days to 2.2 seconds and to be, be, they were able to be more specific about where a particular batch of mangoes had come from. So it works in that, in that regard, but there's still this question of does it contribute to um, environmental governance in, in a larger way? Does, does the transparency, is there two things? Um, one, does having a blockchain automatically guarantee that your supply chain is more transparent? And two, uh, does that transparency actually build trust in supply chains and help us make sure that they are sustainable in the end? Um, to the first question, one of the early examples uh, regarding the transparency provided by blockchain, for the past couple of years, Cargill uh, has been selling Thanksgiving turkeys in the US and they decided that consumers would uh, be able to scan a code on that turkey and find out what farm it had come from and that was done using a blockchain based system. Um, but as this, this uh, screenshot here is from an article in the New Food Economy last year and they pointed out that even though you could do this, it doesn't necessarily convey any meaningful information uh, about the, say, the animal welfare conditions that that turkey was raised in, the environmental impact of production, or the livelihoods uh, of the people producing those turkeys. So having a blockchain doesn't automatically guarantee that your supply chain is truly transparent. Um, and so the larger issue that I think has a lot of potential going forward is, is thinking about governance. Um, uh, the, several communities have looked at this, including um, the UN, political economists, and legal scholars. The legal scholars and the political economists um, say that even though you have this technology which is kind of founded in libertarian ideas um, that is trying to tend towards a more distributed, um, democratized and te technologized uh, economy. Um, 
there's powerful actors, namely corporations and states, that have uh, both the resources and the incentives to actually take those technologies, adapt them, and then deploy them for their own um, interests and purposes. Uh, and you might, you know, the, and the, and to, when they, when corporations and states do that, they could, they would tend to entrench their own um, already powerful interests. Um, the United Nations, in this uh, document of talking about the legal aspects of blockchain, pointed to three key issues to think about in terms of governance of blockchains going forward. The first is access. Um, how could blockchains be implemented across different social and legal contexts for supply chains? And how do you educate people to actually participate in, in those? Um, privacy is a big thing. How do you manage information in a system that's intentionally designed to copy and distribute information across the network while balancing people's rights to privacy uh, and still getting the transparency that was the whole point or one of the major points of using this uh, in the context of a supply chain. And then um, the third thing, which I think the word comes from the legal world, which I'm not super familiar with, but remedy. Um, most legal systems in the world recognize that they can't anticipate every possible eventuality. Reality is unpredictable. And so if you have a smart contract on the blockchain, it could be of it would have to be of infinite length to take into account all possible contingencies. So it's likely that an effective blockchain system would still need to involve some type of human input or control. Uh, and then there's some practical considerations. As anyone who has looked at the beef production uh, system in Brazil might know, um, implementation could be hard. At the, at the early end where you have lots of small ranchers, transactions tend to be very informal. Um, and there's issues around land title, uh, redrawing of boundaries, um, mixing of cattle from illegally deforested uh, areas and existing pastures, um, and also falsification of documents. So in light of all of those challenges, uh, what can we say about blockchains for environmental governance? First, um, it does work. Supply chains have been digitally monitored using blockchain. It can improve traceability and efficiency. However, and I think this is the take home message, it is unlikely to improve governance in contexts where you already, where you have major existing um, challenges in your institutions. As it turns out, blockchain actually requires collaboration in the physical and social worlds as well. You have to have basic things like electricity and, inter and internet protocols as well as more complex things like rule of law and social networks. Um, so people are starting to look into this. Uh, Fleming and her group uh, in Australia and Camillaris and her group in Spain have talked about some potential uh, enabling conditions for good uh, blockchain governance. Um, having the supporting institutions, good regulatory frameworks, policies, um, education, making sure that people have access to this, thinking about equity in the design of the systems. Um, uh, and I'd like to point out too that for the for the GOP community that I think scientific engagement is really important because these companies are building the protocols that will go into the blockchain code, uh, and we want to make sure that what they're the assumptions they're making about the environmental impact of production are based on good evidence from the land system science community. So. I uh, was able to talk to quite a, few, uh, a number of people in industry, uh, as well as had some great advisors at uh, BU that helped put this together. So, love to hear some questions. Uh, in the back first. Okay. Oh, sorry. Do you want to do that? Okay. <laughs> sure. That's a great point. I think it's a huge assumption in the theory of change behind using blockchains for, for this that people actually will care enough to, to bother looking at that.
Mm-hmm. Negotiate prices with middlemen, etc. Greenwashing or something about that slows the system that is buying up our products. Right. I think it is the. I mean, it's the hope of some blockchain pilots that it could actually help with that in terms of letting people farther upstream know what what kind of prices are be, are happening downstream and and how they could connect with their consumers. Um, that's yeah, that's a very interesting area. I'm sorry, I'll let you point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead. They're in super early stages, and I think at this point they've selected some some actual partners to work with, companies that are producing things that rely on natural resources. Um, and they have a pretty ambitious vision of of, um, of all of that stuff working <laughs> working to, together, but it's still quite early stage. I'm sorry, if, uh, did that answer your question? Yeah. Um, How do, you, how do you avoid people doing that, evading taxes? Yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> I, would, I mean, I think, you know, if these, if these were actually implemented, no doubt the, the government would be involved. And um, in something I read, there's even, you know, talk where, like, the taxes could, it could if, if it was well designed and everyone was participating, it could actually make tax collection more transparent and efficient because that would just come out. Uh, in the system automatically, and everyone would see that it had been taken taken out. But it's not something I've particularly looked into. Yeah, yeah. For tax, for tax. Mm. Well, I'll have to look it up. It's not one that I was super looking at. Thanks. Yeah. How are we doing, time? Okay. Mm-hmm. to make it work. Yeah. If you look at what they suggested, it's also the reason why there was a, pro- there was a problem in the first place that required the use of blockchain. Mm-hmm. So if we have to do this, why don't we <laughs> Uh, I agree pretty strongly with that, actually. Uh, <laughs> it's, um, it forms a lot of the basis of my own kind of critical skepticism about how these might work. And it's like, if these are your enabling conditions, will those sound like good conditions for a functioning uh, supply chain and society anyway? So, yeah, it, it's interesting that. Good question. On the first one, um, I can't speak definitively, but I think that what it's trying to um, offer there is is maybe maybe just like a a more organized system. And and you're right, there are actually other technologies that can basically provide this kind of traceability. It just doesn't have the, the cryptographic like blockchain component. And it might be the case that those are actually just fine um, for the purposes. So I think that's very much a question. One of the things I've th- thought of is that blockchain has almost given people a shorthand for an idea of, the, or for the concept of software that would do uh, this kind of linking among the different actors. Um, I think that there's been, I didn't talk about this in this presentation because I didn't have time, but there have been some issues where, you know, <clears throat> um, people have questioned whether the audits are really uh, accurate or, or whether there's an incentive for the audits to provide um, good information. 
<laughs> Can I stick it in there? Okay, I'm, I'm probably going to take a broader perspective. We are looking at a small, smart agricultural policy, and our question is that how digital technology um, could be used in agricultural policy and then how this can lead to land use transformations. Um, so digitalization is going on in agriculture at the moment, uh, in the pro production and trade. Um, we've, we've got robots, we've got uh, software, we've got apps that farm, farmers are using, we've got drones, we've got satellites, we've got milking robots, um, many different things, and uh, they have also a lot of data in it. Um, and this is all summarized as smart, as smart farming, but that also needs more than technology. Um, you perhaps need diversity of technology to fit the local circumstances, to maintain evolutionary potential. Uh, you need institutions to get these technologies running, to certify them, to assess them. Um, you need networks <coughs> for information to develop um, common understanding, uh, farmer, ex farmer to farmer exchange, etc. And within this context, we are asking what are the opportunities and challenges for agricultural policy that is focusing on land use transformations. So what we are doing is um, we are trying to conceptualize, or we are conceptualizing, how digitization can affect agricultural policy. And the focus of this presentation is on policy affecting land use. And we are summarizing insights on potential policy effects from the literature on digital agriculture. It's fairly broad. Many, you have to use many different search terms, actually, because digital, digital and digitization is just like a very broad term. Uh, we're doing this within the project for the Federal Office of Agriculture in Switzerland. Um, that includes uh, research and outreach. We are developing an evaluation scheme for the Swiss uh, Federal Office and we are identifying um, development pathways and intervention pos uh, possibilities here. Now I'm going to look at uh, opportunities mainly. Um, so you have cheaper and more expansive monitoring of practices, of farming practices, land use practices. This is just one example where you use satellites to identify uh, the crops grown on fields. Um, you have drones that offer even finer resolution. You could use this for monitoring, for example. Um, then you have sensors in animals. You can use them to, use them to track them, to um, estimate uh, animal welfare. Then you also have sensors in machines here, for example, uh, where you can uh, monitor um, nitrate application. You can also have more effective and efficient measurement of environmental outcomes. So there's this idea of, uh, or these attempts to uh, monitor biodiversity in agricultural landscapes. Many different new and upcoming applications of satellite remote sensing, but also digital uh, in situ uh, monitoring, for example, of water quality. This can be quite interactive, also 
like between public administration and the land users, where they, for example, can directly see what the farmer is doing on the field, what rates they are applying, um, and then perhaps adjust subsidies or yeah, plan their budgets. Or in this case, where wild geese were eating the crop away, then this area is brown, and then you can have more targeted um, compensation payments, for example. So just to summarize this op these opportunities, monitoring can be cheaper. Um, all, all sorts of different um, parameters can be automatically measured with more or less uh, great precision. There's ample uh, information that is of policy relevance that's already being generated, but is it already in excess? That's the question. And for policy, quite important, uh, the mitigation of information asymmetries. So potentially, the government or public administration would know much more about what the farmers are doing now. Then, on the other side, the transactions between farms or within farms, authorities and other enterprises could be more responsive, not a long paper trail. You could have novel administration of policy measures, for example, granting information access instead of documentation duties. That's, of course, also time-saving for farmers. You can have increased public participation in policy making, online consultations, you're already doing this now, you've all, uh, social media involved uh, in the development of policy. You can have increased effectiveness and efficiency of policy measures. They can be, you can have direct and transparent surveillance and that reduces the incentives for misconduct. That's also relating to um, information asymmetries. You have reduced uncertainty and information asymmetries, again, um, so non-point uh, source pollution could become point source pollution, and then there's also potential for more spatially targeted measures. But it's all not so easy. We have all sorts of, um, well, you have the influence of farmers, politics, and the techn technology itself and public administration on, on the possibilities of digital agricultural policy. There are challenges for farmers, for example, on how to deal with the technology, if perhaps they also need to invest. There are challenges for public administration, for example, the skill sets and the infrastructure you have to have. There's challenges for policy making, um, information overflow, social media, etc. And there would also be challenges for businesses. Um, I'm not looking into this. Now, we are trying to develop a framework somehow to, to get a grip on, on this issue. Um, we're looking first at goals of policy, then the constraints, not every policy or policy measure is pos possible, or the use of digital technology in it, and we would also have costs. Now, um, with the goals, um, you can have goals with many different attributes. An example is the stability of goals, for example, if you have so social media discussions about agricultural policy goals. <coughs> then there are questions of spatial range and place. And goals may also be linked, and they may be more or less explicitly linked. Then political constraints, distributional issues of using digital technology. Um, we might have policy-making conventions that wouldn't allow using digital technology in the decision-making because you're doing somehow differently. Uh, political resources, for example, there you could think of uh, using information technology in, in lobbying, in like inside and outside lobbying, for example, using social media. Um, legal constraints, um, when we use technology in policy, quite often there are also legislative issues. Yeah? You can't do everything. And there's a long tradition. You have treaties between states, you have federalism within the states, um, you have neighboring administration, for example, um, legislation, for example, environmental legislation and agricultural legislation, and if you have to, to decide on an environmental monitoring program, for example, that might have issues. And you have administrative procedures um, that are also legally inscribed. Digital technology can have an effect on the production of the policy goal, for example, um, carbon sequestration. You might have better technology if you use it digitally. Um, that would have a typical cost, capital investment, training, operation and maintenance and management, fairly standard. 
Um, and the big area actually for policy here and for digital technology is implementation, big information needs, um, monitoring efforts, um, also in enforcement, um, there's, there's a big role to play perhaps. Um, the question here is, however, like who is, is actually doing it and paying it, the land user or the government? And you have the effect on public finance. Uh, for example, if you subsidize digital technologies, that has, that has an effect on public revenue. Um, there might be access burden, depending on the efficiency gains in agricultural production. And then overall, to do this, um, you would have administrative costs. They might be lower with digital technology or they might be more expensive. Now, um, now I'd like to focus just on two dimensions of digital agriculture policy. These are all dimensions we are going to consider. One is the question of the locus of discretion. Is it with the government or is it with the farm? And the other one is um, the input-output correlation. So you can, for example, focus um, policy on inputs like fossil fuels or the output in terms of like a carbon balance of a farm. Um, here's an example of biodiversity. You can have output-oriented uh, measurement or uh, measure-oriented uh, output or outcome-oriented policy or measure-oriented policy just to um, have more biodiversity. This can be the expensive meadow or you measure the biodiversity directly. You can do this through payments, monetary incentives, or you, pres you pres prescribe something precisely. So now the question for us is, like, where would agricultural policy go? Um, can move in any different directions, not so clear for us. Maybe something is intuitive for you. Um, the next slides I'm going to uh, click through, very long. But basically, this is ongoing research. We only have pre uh, preliminary propositions. And for this audience, we have some questions to explore. How will digital on-site monitoring relate to remote sensing and land use for policy? It's something more technical. And we are quite interested in cases of digital policy that would be interesting to analyze in depth. Because we have to start somewhere. We are more or less like the first ones taking a broader perspective on this. Um, yeah. Thank you. GDPR? Yeah, so to basically um, simplify the, um, the rights that an individual has to know how they're going to be used, the rights to be forgotten um, from both um, um, using the payment pay and beyond. Um, and so in relation to that, how farmers are likely going to take the surveillance and the under the term surveillance? Um, yeah. Yes. They don't like it, but they get, in some countries like Switzerland, they get a lot of subsidies and they don't like the paperwork. So there's a bit of like a deal. And the farmers unions, they are involved in this. And they, in some, like in, in Switzerland, they have like a carter uh, where they provide like a general perspective on, on such issues. And in Europe, they something, like in the EU, they're doing something more on the technology level. Uh, but not so much on policy, which is a bit of an issue. In the EU, you have, well, you actually already have quite a lot of digital technology and also for mon monitoring farms, and th that's linked to the subsidies farmers are re receiving. Whether they, like if you have generally stronger legislation on privacy issues, um, that could affect then, in turn, also what is possible within digital agricultural policy, of course. And that's like this is also this issue of let neighboring legislation and hierarchy of policy goals. Okay, it seems like your answer has <laughs> written in capitalism. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the interesting talk. So what I understand at the moment, uh, most of the data from the social system was technology now, now it's private and not public. So how do you foresee the action of public authorities, of authorities and policy makers in these kind of I, 
one perspective would be the perspective of, of the cost and transaction cost between um, the public administration and the farms. And if you use satellite data, that's fairly coarse, but uh, maybe sufficient enough to target uh, uh, the monitoring activities and sending out officers, for example. This is one thing. And the other one, perhaps there will be new projects or more like on the, the project scale where they try, for example, a new program to support, um, for example, biodiversity on farms and they would do it with, with certain technologies or fertilization precision farming. Uh, so you would use the visual data, not the data that are uh, It's an open question. Um, there's already a lot of data there. Um, but I guess uh, for most policy cases, in the end, um, it's, it's a legal issue. And, and in the end, it, if, if there's really conflict, it would end before court or something comparable. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, so like within this framework, this would be perhaps political constraints. If you like have a certain goal, then it would be a political constraint. Uh, I would include it there. Yeah, usually there would be representatives and then the other, that would be one area and the other one, other area would be at the implementation level and, and the cost level of the farm. So some farmers won't, won't do it because of the cost or if you want to implement a policy that, per exa for example, prescribes the use of precision farming and the farmers don't like it or they, 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 they're not really using it, um, then that's an implementation failure. Pardon? Yeah, of course. And then it's like that's something you need to consider at the very bottom end of implementation when the, like the front end officer is standing before the farmer. Like, why are you not using it? This, of course, also needs to be considered in policy design at the higher level. And there's many, many questions. Can I just take one more? Do you wish to continue? Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I have a question uh, from the consumer's perspective, as being a consumer. How much is driven your policies by consumer demand, particularly maybe outside of Switzerland? Does you set up different technologies? Is it part of the competition to the market? It's uh, like artificially created, or it's also coming from the consumer perspective that they want to know, for instance, to trade the products? Yeah, like that would be like something in the broader, um, like taking a broader perspective of agricultural governance. That could be something like through the, the supply chains, value chains, where, where you have some alternatives, and that may be facilitated with digital technology. Yeah. Um, and the other thing could be, for example, also farmers are now crowdsourcing for flower strips and, and these sort of things. So that would be, like, it's not, not official policy, but it's like farmer citizen engagement and somehow it could be considered policy. So it could be that to, in, in certain areas, it, it won't be traditional policy making anymore. Mel, thanks a lot. I'm very sorry, there's many more questions. Thank you. I, I need this one. This one. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, want, I don't, I don't need this. Yes, good afternoon. Um, I will talk about the beautiful Swiss landscape and how we can describe it using machine learning algorithms. Um, having a consistent and concise description of the landscape in the form of a landscape typology allows us to address each landscape and 
um, formulate specific development goals, management strategies, and thus it helps us to secure the landscape quality. And the way we, we would traditionally do this is uh, by uh, GIS-based, indicator-based mapping. Um, and I thought, why not using all the data that is being released, being available, and try to um, um, apply a machine learning approach? Because one problem that we have when using this GIS-based uh, mapping is that it's very time-consuming to set up the model, and it's um, quite unflexible, and not very transferable to other areas. And my idea was to simply gather all the data, feed it to the algorithm, and then that would be pretty much um, adaptable no matter how much input data you have, you can apply it to other regions. And this is a project that was led by the Swiss Foundation for Landscape Conservation. And they have, uh, a couple of years ago, developed a um, catalog of characteristic cultural landscapes that uh, describes 38 different landscapes. And uh, that includes um, more of these um, cultural and, and human in aspects of the landscape. And thus, such a catalog helps us to overcome like the traditional um, land use, land cover classes and add more of the, of the human and cultural impact or aspect. Um, okay, so what we did is um, the, the foundation, they developed the typology together with experts in a series of workshops. And so they did a participatory mapping. They were drawing on the map, discussing which type is really present and which is not. And uh, we gathered a lot of data, 67 different variables. Um, that is population density, that is uh, age of buildings, land cover, but also things like the amount of dry stone wall in that area. And, and then I had two things that I tried to do. Um, first of all, I, I simply tried to rep reproduce um, the participatory mapping, so the typology. Um, using a random forest approach and also comparing it to this uh, rule-based GIS indicator-based approach, just to see if it's possible to, you know, to do this typology using the, the machine learning. And the other idea was we're very framed um, by developing this typology using all these classes of forest and settlement and so forth. And maybe the computer can find other patterns using all this data that we, that we feed to the computer. So we could, we could think about learning from these machines. Um, so this is uh, that typology. It uh, consists of 26 different classes, and they're grouped into um, these so-called texture, textures. And as you can see, they have uh, different levels of detail. For example, there's a lot of different settlement types. And for you to give you an idea, during this, this process of developing the map, um, people also had to agree that they had um, land types of landscapes that are not so beautiful, and that was sometimes not so easy to get them to confirm that that also existed. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, moderating such a process can be kind of difficult. Um, you have uh, different infrastructure uh, landscapes, like energy infrastructure or also tourism infrastructure, and you have cultural heritage types, like uh, settlements of historic value. So this kind of typology um, allows us to integrate more of these cultural aspects. Um, then I tried to replicate um, this typology by, by using this, uh, uh, the, the participatory based mapping um, from the, that I showed before. And I, I was running two different uh, random forest algorithms that just had a different configuration. And uh, like the overall pattern seemed to fit pretty well. And for the indicator-based mapping, we did, um, we tried to um, develop these rules using a PCA to um, find out what, what distinguishes the different types. Um, and as you can see, the gray areas are the areas that have not been uh, classified at all. And to give you a, a rough idea of, of how good these um, approaches compare is the JS-based indicator mapping is, is really not doing and good, even though we spent quite a lot of time in trying to, to set it up, so um, it's really not the way to go. And the random forest, the different uh, parametrizations, they are not doing very good overall, but, but they're in a comparable range. And this is like a, a f not a, a first try, but this could be 
largely improved by you know better better data pre-processing and things like that so that could be improved a lot um, then I was uh, looking at this other question of what can we learn from the from the machine so what kind of pattern are we actually looking at the right kind of pattern or are we completely missing out on something um, and therefore I simply used clustering approaches um, different k-means also like different parametrizations and k meduits and just from the map you can see that you have more um, different classes like a more detailed picture and now I was um, looking at this is a so-called category components plot and it simply tells you so this compares um, this compares the the map from the model with the real map and it tells you the smaller the bar the better the fit and my idea was that um, so where you have a good um, overlap or correlation between this is where the computer is sure and it's also recognizing the same pattern as we do but where the fit is not very good this is where we haven't really found the right pattern or there might be another pattern and I was um, expecting that this would be in um, in like the peri-urban areas where there's a mixture of urban and rural land use and it's not so clear but all these natural areas that would be very um, um, easy to detect but it turns out um, the, the red ones are the ones that are not don't have a good correlation and the green ones are the ones with a good fit and actually I was, I was pretty surprised because I could see that the energy infrastructure or, or transition transformation landscapes had a very good agreement and like all the higher alpine alpine landscapes rocky landscapes and also forest all these natural not all of them but natural landscapes didn't have a very clear pattern apparently or there's another pattern that we're not seeing and I, I found that pretty surprising so in my logic that would mean that this is where we would have to look for other patterns and apparently all this peri-urban and transformation stuff seems to be pretty pretty clear um, so what have we learned so this GIS based mapping is, is really um, I don't say it's completely impossible to do but you spend a lot of effort and it's not worth it um, there's a lot of data available and that's really amazing and I get really excited about it but you know just getting gathering the data like downloading it or asking people to send it to you and then joining it all together is it still requires quite a lot of work um, and then these algorithms are, are available and are quite easy to apply but still um, you can improve it a lot with some with some more knowledge on how to split the test and training data how to do the pre-processing and everything in general it's quite easy to apply and there's different software packages and everything but yeah if you want to then improve it a little more then it, it, you need to have a deeper look into it so as a as a first conclusion if you're like a one of these um, government representatives and you have a certain amount of money you need to have this uh, mapping done in, in very most efficiently then I would recommend to use this participatory process to do it really properly involve as many people as you can do it iteratively and so forth it's way better than this uh, all this digital mapping <laughs> but <laughs> but I do see a big potential um, like if you can improve all these the machine learning algorithms then you could for example project this typology to other areas this could be um, also relevant to, to um, more remote areas or areas where you don't have experts um, or just less knowledge about it and what could also be interesting is time series analysis if you could train the model on um, aerial images or derivatives of aerial images you could do time series analysis and see how the typology evolved over, over time, which would be hard, I guess, to do with experts and all. So if we come back to this uh, topic of the session, digitalization and land transformation, I think we can do um, much better in using um, the, the potential of the data. We're not harvesting the full potential of all the data that is being, being available. And because, for example, I had these 67 variables, but um, if I kicked out all the ones that, had, that didn't have an explanatory um, value then I was uh, left with only 12 so I spent a lot of time of collecting all this data and putting it all together and in the end <laughs> they didn't really explain anything so maybe you could first think about what might be useful or then you would have to go further and use deep learning um, approaches where that really make use of all the data 
Um, I think it's an interesting idea of um, this topic of learning from ideas, learning from the machines. So, you know, be a bit creative in applying these algorithms. Um, we see that these traditional approaches of participatory mapping, um, but also, I guess, simple models are still valuable, so no need to get rid of them all at once. And the strength of this project was really the combination of qualitative and quantitative um, information. So you don't only have the experts, but you're also not only relying on the models. So bringing it all together is like really the way to go. Thank you. Yeah, so 26 land use classes, yeah. yeah. How did you decide which ones to assign to which? For the GIS based thing? Yeah, we, yeah, yeah, so it's. So, so for the, um, for the GIS based, I used, I used the PCA to, to derive which variable was most important for which class. Um, and for the random forest, I didn't, I didn't do anything beforehand. So I just put the whole data set into the model. There is some discussion, particularly with random forest, whether it's useful to reduce the data before or not. But actually, the, the opinions are not that clear. Um, for some machine learning algorithms, you, it's better to reduce your data beforehand, like to do some pre-processing. But for the random forest, it was... It wasn't that clear, but... What, what was your why? Can you explain the methodology? Yeah, what was your why you chose The classes, the typology. And how did you choose the assignment again? By, by the spatial overlay. So, so I had, so basically I had a, a, a big raster with the ID of the typology and then all the variables. And the variables are always like the amount of blah, 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 the amount of footprint of the house or the amount of trees or the amount of and then I tried to you know my the idea was that the computer could figure out so for this type this kind of variable is important for this type this kind of variable is important for this type this kind of variable is important which is what I'm trying to do by hand more or less with the GIS So, um, so it was embedded in a political process, and it's actually now being also um, part of uh, part of like the um, like a master plan. That's, but but now they're sort of negotiating negotiating about it. So probably in the end, it will not look the same. But that was that was the incentive of the of the government to ask for this. Um, so that was a clear like political strategy. And then the amount of classes, it's actually a big, a big discussion because you can do it with only 10 and then it's pretty straightforward and then you don't need to, go to do all the modeling. Um, but um, they were really trying, so the, the Swiss Foundation, they were really trying to get a more detailed um, picture because that also allows you to, to uh, work more on the local level and, and be more precise with the, the development goals because otherwise you basically would end up saying like, yeah, forest, and, but having different types of forests is more interesting. Um, uh, to be more targeted. And this was decided in group discussions, and there were people from different offices and different um, government agencies involved. And that's actually a big success of the project that they were able to agree upon these classes. Okay, thanks a lot again, Bettina.
this is Methodic. Okay, correct. Um, you need to put this on. Sorry. I don't like my microphone, so it's better with it. I don't think it's better. Okay, so that's five good. Five minutes, okay? Yeah, you let me know. Okay. Well, I guess uh, as the last speaker, a bit of a shift from the previous talks might not be on, uh, on an experience of Australia that uh, we have been working in, in how to, um, we have collected prior to the SDGs, we began doing this work on, on mapping landscapes, and then um, this talk is about uh, our thinking on how some of this uh, information that has been uh, derived could serve to the, for the government to um, set targets and to report on the SDGs. So I think um, first is reminding what, what, what the SDGs are about and the 2030 agenda and the particularities or the differences of the SDGs in relation to uh, things like the MDGs. So I think it's important to remind ourselves of the huge number of targets and the, the associated number of indicators. And we have seen in many talks and, and in papers that we read that people say, well, my remote sense, you know, my data set contribute to the SDGs, uh, which is easy to say when you talk at the goal level, but many times then that is a constraint when you begin to narrow down up to the target or the indicator levels. And all the, uh, saying the other point is that all the, the implementation phases, the design are going to be done by the countries. And the other thing is also that is um, according to the national circumstances. So there is not set goal and target, it's up to the countries to decide on that one. So th the target setting and the reporting also are voluntary at national level. So what would be the role of, of big earth data in all these things? We know that the big data has associated this concept of the four Bs and then um, uh, my question is, well, how those four Bs of big data could serve to the SDGs and to what aspects of the SDGs? Is it in baseline, in target setting, is it in monitoring? And I think before I continue, one important thing to remind ourselves is that um, it's not a, that Earth observation, because we are working mostly with biophysical um, mapping that we are doing of the land surface, it's not that we say we are going to map the SDGs, but we really are, are, are uh, capturing some spatial temporal information that we can then relate to specific indicators, whether those being the tier one, two, or three of the uh, uh, UN statistical div division as they have been updated up to December 2018. So with that said, is now uh, what we have been doing in Australia as a group. Uh, since uh, about 10 years ago, the government did a, a big investment in creating this open data access, um, data infrastructure for a better serving research and management, um, for uh, enabling um, more research and development, and then uh, the, the compromise was to, to work at the landscape level, to work collecting different types of data sets. And I always think that as um, I provide there a, a list of all the different uh, ecosystems that we have, I always say that, say, let's compare Australia. Australia is 180 times larger than Switzerland, 14 times larger than France. So we, in terms of scale, we are working with a country, but it's a country, an island, and a continent at the same time. So we have many, um, it's a large space to cover and to map. Um, I think it's also a good example of governance, so how mu multiple uh, institutions from the research and from the government came together to develop this, uh, this platform. And uh, aside enabling R&D, um, the, the final purpose is that it can provide better science evidence for decision making and for policy, or at least this is what we aim to. It works at three scales, the scale going from the landscape uh, level where we are trying to monitor to the surveillance to the uh, to understand at the process level so the causes why things are changing what are the reasons what are the drivers for that we use a set of um, field uh, airborne and satellite coming from um, areas that are related to biodiversity land and terrain carbon and and, um, and water and for all of that the main purpose of the the term, the, re the terrestrial research network, is about uh, having uh, an analysis and integrated data and delivery, and therefore we have also um, protocols in place. These are some examples of the remote sensing data set that are being used. 
And now I guess I'd like to take you in like speed dating or how some of the things we have done, otherwise uh, I will get kick off. So I have several things to show. It's just showing and you can get it through the internet. Um, how did, uh, uh, one, of, one of the components of CERN was uh, about delivering uh, layers that in different layers that could serve to the purposes of vegetation mapping and dynamics. So we did collect time series of uh, over 30 years of land cover dynamics. This is all the layers, and then we said, as uh, Peter said yesterday in the presentation, well, um, how these things could serve uh, to, to the SDGs. Now, we were not the first to ask that question because the Committee on Earth Observations uh, Satellites did an in a report that, that published last year with their own views as to what um, indicate, uh, what targets and what goals Earth Observation could contribute to monitor, what of those indicators. Using that idea, we replicated for the data sets that I show you um, just before, and then uh, we, we kind of use the goals as filters and the targets, and uh, it, we did use a scheme of like three um, inputs that we saw, whether more direct, indirect as a proxy, or whether somehow relevant. Um, in doing that grouping, these are the goals that came as the most relevant, as, as expected, uh, biophysical life on land is the one with the largest amount of input that we could expect from remote sensing. Um, so now is a, a use case that we did on, on trying to understand what data sets we needed, not only for developing the indicators, but remember that it's about SDGs implementation, it's about planning, and also it's about monitoring and, and tracking the implications of some of the measures that are put in place. So that requires some uh, historical and current data sets, and we developed to that end the, this example of uh, a mangrove data portal where you can see on the left um, the collection of all kind of historical data sets. We didn't have an homogeneous map covering all of Australia with mangroves, so we did collect the historical data sets, the near real-time observations, trying to isolate where the data gaps were, were present, and then how that could inform the right side of the, of the, of the yeah, that right side that is uh, to do with um, more with the policy and with informing the national and international scale. So, so uh, that is complemented then for a lot of the investment from this turn uh, in infrastructure went into data calibration and validations for field data collection that can, and, and we develop apps where you can uh, collect information for verification as we spoke before, but also to feed into uh, an open access biomass library that is being built by every people, people that goes to the field, can use the app and upload the information. We also had some information uh, collected with drones for verification as to what is the state, the change in state of some of the mangrove ecosystem and the why of the change. Um, we collected also uh, high resolution satellite data sets to estimate changes in difference to establish especially the extent and the, 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 the speed of change of some of the diseases that in this case did affect mangrove because of different pressures in the area. And with that, we could build uh, what I say, we can have a legacy baseline as to what, if we are going to assess in the future any improvement or, uh, or decrease, where are we up to uh, and how we could use this baseline. So I think uh, all this should be good enough, um, but it was a proof of concept. So for us, it was a question how we take this puzzle and we apply that to the national, at the national level. And it's in there that things that come such as partnership and collaboration. So we took the proof of concept developed under the term working with Geoscience Australia, which is the agency that looks after the mapping of the whole of the continent. They have developed the concept of the data cube. They like it, the idea of the mangrove, and they convert it into a layer. With that layer now, we had the first map and series of map of Australia from 86 to 2016 that can deliver the changes in mangrove areas. Um, and this is the purpose of the data cube. We also then could incorporate some um, conditions on a state of change because there are environmental variables that you can bring up to. And we put then uh, additional environmental variables for understanding better the causes and the consequences. After all what I said, you might say, well, how? These things were all used in the, in the monitoring and reporting that the country did. So the first one we did was in, 19, in 2008. Please give me one minute to finish. Uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade did produce the first voluntary national reporting, and you would say, well, they first assessed what they had, what they didn't have using all data sets, and only half of the 200 and, and 44, 233 
232 indicators uh, we had information for. Uh, they, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trades called for projects. Our project is one that of the ones that was portrayed in that database, but it was shown as a semi-quantitative. We have these things, but not, not all the information that I just showed you was used, more of a kind of what we have achieved as a nation in terms of collection, but could we do, I say could we do more than that. So my last, my last slide is about, yes, we did have everything to show, but it was not fully used. I think the role of Big Earth Data goes around these four points that I put there. There is a potential for those, but uh, I think it's also as important as, as for us what makes the, this, these products to be used. We produce a, a lot of these things, but if we don't find a client, it's then very difficult that these things really become operational. And we, we discuss in these forums a lot about um, uh, veracity and, 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 and up-to-date information and so on, but it's also as important, I think, as to understand how we engage and who we engage with so that the data sets that we develop are used at the end of the day. Um, so for me, this is the quick talk, and thank you for the, for the listening and um, more information in the website. Thank you. Thank you for the extra minute.